Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I I will talk about uh, a few projects I recently did with together with Mona, with Tan, and a few other colleagues. And uh, the first topic is about transferability in ecological niche modeling. So I have uh, two goals. I want to evaluate the accuracy of doing that, and also I want to improve it. So that's the theme of the first talk. So I, we all know the ecological niche model takes the current data, takes the environmental data. We throw that to the algorithm, and then we can get the estimate of the ecological niche. Here, I, I mean the abiotic niche or the fundamental niche. And it is the, we all know that the model transfer is very frequently used. It can be transferred across space, all be project across time. But the question is, is such model transfer accurate? And so obviously we want to evaluate that. And my colleague and I, we did our simulation experiment. We want to, uh, we, we simulated our niche in the environmental space, and then we project the niche into the geographical space. So here the, the red area is the existing fundamental niche. This is red thing is the fundamental niche. So it is uh, the, the red area environmentally was incompletely represent the fundamental niche. So further, we spatially cut the distribution. This is a whole potential distribution into six pieces. And each piece is generally corresponding to a similar proportion of the distribution area. And each of them represent a small portion of the previous defined fundamental niche. For example, this smaller uh, yellow area corresponding to this darker area that is within the fundamental niche that we defined. And the question is, given this small portion of this fundamental niche, which is probably true in reality because we always know a small portion of species distribution, and can this accurately recover this whole fundamental niche? So we, we include a, a 10 algorithm, but I will only show you the result of our few. Um, to the, the, the first result I want to show you is the prediction of the vote claim. Sorry, prediction of the bio claim. The, the red area is the previously defined fundamental niche, and this darker area is the portion of the niche we use to train the model, and the yellow part is the prediction. So you can, it's, it's kind of a little obvious that this estimated niche is some kind of underestimate of the fundamental niche. And then the next one, I want to show the other extreme example. So similarly, the black area, the stark area, is the portion we use to train the model, and the yellow area is the estimated niche by Maxen. However, I have to uh, say that we are using the minimum training presence threshold because we, are, because we know the whole distribution. So we have a good reason to use that threshold. So the conclusion can be given a small portion of information of the niche, those current regression-based or maybe machine learning-based algorithm, are, they are going to have a difficulty in, in estimating the fundamental niche. And this means all those applications that do this invasive species potential distribution or maybe species distribution response to climate change, there are uncertainties associated with that transfer. So my next question is, so how to improve such model transferability? And the idea that I have is to use physiological knowledge as a guideline to help the model make predictions. Um, so, so obviously the second goal is to improve it based on this idea. If we think about the, as I, I, I was mentioning yesterday, essentially the model, modeling the niche is kind of modeling the response curve. The x-axis can be an environmental condition. The y-axis, ideally, the y-axis would be the probability of presence. And ideally, we want to draw a curve, something like that. But in reality, a lot of times, time we only know a small portion of species distribution. If we think about that along this figure, say we know some distribution of species within this range of environmental condition, and 
We want to know where the species is going to occur here. Say so this is after global warming. So we want to make prediction in that novel condition. If we only know this half portion of the knowledge of species niche, we can probably only adequately draw half of the curve. And for the rest, how can we do it? I would say there can be ultimate ways to do it. Because we know we have no knowledge about that, so we can just extrapolate in any way that you think reasonable, but there's they may have nothing to do with the fundamental niche. And without the data support, basically you cannot adequately draw that part. So I think why we cannot adequately draw that part is because we're missing two kind of informations. One is, where is the end of this extrapolation? Where should this curve stop? And the second one is, what is generally the, the slope of that curve? Well, for the first question, where, where is that end? Probably we can use the physiological limits. We can get this from experiments, or maybe we can observe this from based on empirical evidence. And if we know there is a, say, temperature limit, we can use that as a guideline to tell the model, OK, you should stop here. And from that physi physiological limits, you should not make high predictions. You should not make, say, um, you shouldn't make prediction of high probability of presence because we know that's the uh, that's the end. Even though, even even though we know that the physical physiological limits, there still can be different ways to do this extrapolation because we don't know the slope. Uh, so my idea is to to, to use some um, survival data from the survival ship analysis. So. Here's the example of our uh, survival analysis. So given people simulate the gradient of temperature and then the measure the, the, the time that they survive until death. If you plot them on this figure, on the x-axis it can be temperature, the y-axis is survival time. And, and also if you do the log transformation of survival time, they're gonna fall into a close to linear uh, relationship. And this is naturally true in a lot of survival ship analysis. And usually when people model this, they use a linear model, say alpha plus beta times uh, temperature. And here I think the information I'm most interested in is the beta, the slope, because it tells you the relative uh, performance of the species under different temperatures. For example, if the slope is two, it means survival time under 31 Celsius degree is gonna be twice longer than the survival time under 32 Celsius degree. So it's a relative relationship. And I want to borrow this information into the, into the prediction of species probability of presence. However, under a key assumption. The assumption is there is a true golden underlying suitability function. This is how species respond to their environmental condition. And this golden function will ultimately determine the species' response to the climate, say the probability of presence. It will also ultimately determine the survival ship. And given that I don't know this golden standard, probably it's reasonable to use the known things from the survival ship analysis to use that slope migrate that to the, to the ecological niche model. So get, let's get back to this response curve. So we know the limits, we know the curve. Then probably we can do a better job in do this extrapolation. So that's the ideal, like the idea, but, we'll, but will it work? And how good it would be when you like experiment to, to test it? So what I did is I used zebra muscle as an experiment. Uh, I collect the, the distribution of zebra muscle. I cut this into two pieces. I, I cut the current study into two groups. One is the whole global distribution. And I assume the global distribution have, would have a better representation of the fundamental niche. It will be not a perfect representation, but a relatively better. The second group is I only use the 
the native distribution of zebra mussel, and I will assume that is our incomplete representation of the fundamental niche. So, so ideally, those, those if I train the model with two this with these two group of occurrences, I may get different results. Probably the global occurrence data set would give me a better model of the fundamental niche, given there are more data. And using those two groups as a control, I did another model based on occurrence, native occurrence data, but plus physiological, physiological information. And specifically, it is the zebra mussel upper thermal tolerance and zebra mussel survival ship data. So my expectation would be this, this native model would be worse than the global model. Both of them are trained with the traditional uh, regression-based or maybe machine learning-based algorithm. The middle one is based on native occurrence data, so that's a disadvantage compared with the global model. However, it has the physiological information. My expectation would be this one would perform in between. It would have some improvement compared with the native model, but maybe not as good as the global model. So here's the results. This is a comparison between the native model and the global model without the physiological knowledge. And this, if you see the dotted line, this is the environmental range of the training data for native occurrences. And this solid line is the environmental condition for the global occurrences. So obviously, the native model gives us a lot of underestimate of the probability along the two extreme two end of the extreme conditions, and probably because the occurrence data is limited into its native distribution. And then this red line is that is, is that native occurrence data plus physiology. So as I told you, I have a, I tell the model here's the limit, here's the upper thermal limit, and then there's the slope according to the survival data. So we can see that the gap of underestimation over the upper, over the higher temperature is partly fielded, whereas the the gap on the lower or colder temperature area is not fielded. I think itself can be a good comparison because I use upper thermal tolerance, but I have no lower thermal tolerance, and it looks like this underestimation has been improved by this red line, which is the physiologically informed model. Um, so, so why why this physio of why physiology is important? Because it can make some uh, more informative, biologically meaningful predictions for the invasive species, particular distribution, or maybe for species distribution and the cl global climate change. And, and, and I think even, even further, given that we can inc include species biology into the model, and we can kind of uh, make, make some uh, more or better estimations, given that, for example, if our species thermal tolerance evolved, say zebra mussel become more heat tolerant. And that if we know that knowledge, but we cannot wait, wait for the zebra mussel to expand their distribution and then collect the occurrence data and then train the model and then know the potential distribution. Given that if we just know the biological knowledge, the zebra mussel evolved, we can just throw that information into the model and make the prediction ahead of time before their range expansion. So obviously for this approach, there are a few challenges. So obviously you need physiological data. Without that information, I mean, how can you make, it, it, it is it would be challenging to, to use this approach. And, and my example is only using one uh, dimensional variable, and potentially I can use more uh, variables, and also computation time is challenging. There we go. That with reproduction, you also um, generally have an increase. And so even with mortality, while that speeds up, 
reproduction under warmer temperatures also increases. So if you're just looking at these snapshots of occurrence data, um, it might be kind of difficult to disentangle those two things. And again, like I'm really impressed with everything you've done, but have you given any thoughts about like how you could reconcile that? Yeah, um, I think I was talking with Tom the other day that the, the niche is more like, a, at, at least generally speaking, it's more like a binary niche. It's yes or no. And, it, and if you think about the, the early literature about niche, it's more about species niche. It's, it's not individual niche, it's not a population niche, it's not a genus niche, it's a species level niche. And um, I think the thought on the reprodu reproductivity, repro reproduce rate and the death rate, I think that is going to give us, if we think about that, that will give us a better understanding of niche. And I think Hutchinson a long time ago had their paper he proposed to to draw contours of repro reproduce rate. Um. <laughs> yeah, he proposed to draw this contours of uh, re reproduce rate and also contours of death rate, and. If you overlap the two things together, you're gonna, you're gonna see, say, how will the population grow? And then, hopefully, you can you can find something like the there's zero when they equal each other, and then they're gonna be higher, higher in the middle. But given the current data that we are commonly do, it's hard. Okay, um, I can continue to the next one. Um, something I did with uh, a few colleagues from Oklahoma and Arizona. So the topic is, does cooling reality matter in Mexican? Uh, <laughs> so what is cooling reality? Cooling reality is the dependence status or among those predictors. So in other words, a bunch of them are all highly correlated at the same time. And there are recent famous paper, a review of cooling reality, for, and there, to summarize their conclusion, all my take home message is, for regression-based model, we should avoid cooling reality. And they propose their threshold, which is a, um, a very simple way to avoid cooling reality is uh, remove variables that are, have high correlation coefficient. And this is, this is some em empirical uh, evidence or rule of thumb for regression-based model in general. However, the rule of cooling reality in Maxine is unclear in literature. And for example, there's one set of theories say uh, it's generally okay for Maxine. And that's, that's, uh, that's our quote. I don't want to over-interpret their, their word, even though they, they try to limit, limit the interpretation into a, a narrower context, but, but generally speaking, it's probably less an issue for Maxine. The other side of the world say, probably we want to minimize the clinical reality, and that's the paper over there, and that's a directly quote from the paper. And it is not only in theory, but also in practice. People do to deal with clinical reality in Maxine differently. For example, this top paper, they use all 19 bioclimatic variables. And on the other side, people try to select variables based on that uh, 0.7 threshold. However, I have to point out that this threshold is empirical rule of thumb from regression-based model. It's not something that is obviously true for makes sense. We don't know. And actually, this second, this second portion is from one of the papers I published. So. This is just make fun of myself. <laughs> um, do not just follow others without a good reason. So this is what I think. For clinical reality, we have to think about it in two perspectives. One is the predictor clinical reality. Here they defined the sum of the correlation coefficients. Say, and, and the other perspective is the clinical reality shift. Say, 
right, right now you train the model with two variables, which are positively correlated. Then you pr project the model to another area where the two variables are negatively correlated. If that's the case, your model may perform bad. And here's an example of in practice how I do this. So I, this is two correlation metrics. The top one is for the training area, the, the, the lower one is for the, the testing or the projected area. And when I say predict the kernel reality, I mean get the sum of the absolute values of all of that. And when I say the kernel reality shift, I mean a minus this matrix by this matrix. So just look at the difference, how much the correlation coefficient has changed for each pair of variables. And then I calculate the sum of the absolute difference. So we need to prove it, if, if my thoughts are good or not. So I did an experiment. I, to manipulate predict the kernel reality, I, do, I, I select variables using two strategies. One is random selection, so I ignore kernel reality. The second approach is avoid high kernel reality using that 0.7 threshold. And the second thing I want to uh, manipulate is that kernel reality shift. So what I did is, I did a bunch of models without model transfer. So when I test the model, I use data from the similar area as the training data. And in another experiment, I did the model transfer. Say I spatially cut my data, and I use w one or a few area to train the model and project the model to another area and, uh, and evaluate that model. But to better explain how I cut the model, here's an example of random segregation when there's no model transfer. And this is an example of model transfer. So I can use three areas to train the model and use the other area to test the model. And, that, and this is what would uh, lead to you to kind of this, the, the, this is the gonna lead to the, a gradient of predictive kernel reality and a gradient of kernel reality shift. So um, if you focus on the top two panels, the y-axis is predictor kernel reality. And this two bars, this for this one, the left one is random selection of variables. For this bar, represent the avoid kernel reality. And you can see that by using different ways to select a variable, I can see a decrease of predictor kernel reality. So if I avoid highly correlated variables, I get a smaller predictive kernel reality. And the second figure shows that, no, I mean the lower two figures show that the kernel reality shift has nothing to do with how I select the variables. However, if you compare those two with those two, the, in the model transfer scenario, I got a high kernel reality shift. So, I want to test if those two variables, these two uh, conditions, that they have any effects on the model performance, which is I use TSS, and I add y which calculated the 5% omission rate. Uh, without showing all the statistical models, I want to give you a summary of the conclusion. So the solid lines all represent significant relationships. If, there are, if it is, this means positive, this means negative. If it is a dashed lines, which means the influence is not significant or non-conclusive. So if you look at the, the top, the very top and the very lower line, so model transfer, when we transfer model spatially, we, we get a lower model performance in the projected area. When we avoid highly correlated variables, it leads to no difference, regardless how you how you where you project the model. And then we can focus on the middle part, which I believe are the mechanism that influence model performance. So model transfer leads to the increase of kernel reality shift. And the kernel reality shift would, have the, would negatively impact TSS, which is the model performance. And then the, when we avoid highly correlated variables that can decrease the predictor kernel reality, 
However, that has nothing to do with TSS. That has nothing to do with model performance. So this is, OK, I can give you a bit, uh, maybe a, a user interpretation of this result. So there are the, the Maxine's author, a bunch of people saying that Maxine can regulate the extra contribution of variables, say, say that may be caused by collinearity. So Maxine can regulate that extra information. So Maxine can deal with collinearity when Maxine is, is being trained as a model. On the other side, the collinearity shift, this is independent of how you train the model. It is mainly your experimental design. It depends on how different your training area and your testing area is. So it has nothing to do with algorithm, because you can easily get a low shift if you, if you train the area, say US, and then project it to a small portion of US. There may be little shift. But if you train the model in US and project to China, then maybe a big shift. So this colonial relative shift is independent of the model algorithm. It is more about how you design your research. Well, um, without going through this um, detailed conclusions, I want to say, I want to talk about this uh, one paper we just talked about. So people think, yeah, yes, Maxim can regulate this extra contributions from variable or reductant efforts from, from variables. Yes, it's true, but only in terms of model training. And, and also, this Maxine is not immune to clinical shift because it is kind of independent from model training. Um, and also, I, I want to caution that this is based on a bunch of species in US and a bunch of species in Australia. I'm only using climatic variables. And I used uh, maybe around 20 or 30 species. So this is, I, I never try to select biological meaningful variables. I just do, do this methodology. I'm trying, just trying to look at the methods, the difference of methods. So I want to caution any over-interpretation of such results before this got published and before other people test it. Um, okay, yeah, that's the end of my talk. <laughs>